Hey everybody. Hi everybody. Hi, I'm Alan Leibovitz. I'm the Associate Dean of the Math Department here. I want to welcome all of you to our second event uh, of Math Awareness Week. How many of you were here this morning for Deal or No Deal? Top of you, did any of you play? Any of you win? Huh? You guys should have been here. You could have won. Somebody won, what, $25 was the most we had? I think we had some, we had some, good, uh, some good games today. Uh, today we have uh, with us renowned author John Hornsby is going to be doing his Math Goes to Hollywood presentation. Uh, John is originally from Louisiana. He was a high school and college teacher for 23 years. In that time of teaching, he started writing textbooks. He is now retired from teaching, writes textbooks full time in all kind of, uh, all through the algebra sequence, pre-calculus, the uh, MGF 1106, 1107, the liberal arts books, which is one of the books we currently use here and have for some time. So uh, we do have some popcorn that is up in the back. Please not everyone go up at the same time to get popcorn. Uh, we'll have it going. Go ahead and grab one. We figure this uh, TV and the movies, you should have a snack, something to eat. So without further ado, Mr. John Hornsby. Thank you, Alan. It's been about, it's been about five years since I've been here, and I'm really happy to be back in Broward. A little bit about this talk. Um, there will be scenes in the movies and television that you might come across from time to time dealing with mathematics and uh, they go through they go pretty quickly and you may not know whether they're they're good they're bad or they're ugly remember good the bad and the ugly that movie you remember that back in the 60s well what i've done is i've collected 20 scenes from uh movies and television and we're going to go through them and look at the mathematics in them and and uh, I want to try to teach you a little bit as well as we go along. Now, the first, uh, the first scene, which is actually two scenes, comes from the sitcom According to Jim. And you remember Jim Belushi was this blue-collar guy, a really nice guy, but not too bright. And then uh, his wife, Cheryl, was a straight-A student. Well, in this scene, uh, Cheryl is trying to help their little girl, uh, Ruby, learn her times tables and there's a little bit of difficulty. So in the second scene, Jim decides he has a better way of, of assisting. I'm 
you so much. I really do, but we've got to get going here. Oh, no, 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 no. Just let Cheryl do it. No, I'm not going to let Cheryl do it. We still got five more of these stupid worksheets. Oh, I hate math. I wish you would die. Do you remember getting this much homework in the second grade? Please, second grade was all about boogers and paste. Rui, how come you have so many worksheets? We stay away from spring homework. We can't finish it. Ha! You sound just like me when I was in school. Did the numbers spin around in your head and swear at you? No. Tired. No, 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 honey. We gotta keep going. We gotta keep going. You know what used to help me with numbers and stuff? It's like a rhyme or a song or something like that. Give, give, give me the beat. Give me the beat. Give me the beat. <laughs> Well, if they had known this trick, they wouldn't have had to go through the marshmallows in the class court. Put your feet flat on the floor, and put your, open your hands, and put your two hands on the top there, okay? Now, let's say you want to multiply 9 times 4. Okay, well, you count four, four fingers from the left, drop that finger, you have three on the left and six on the right. 9 times 4 is 36. If you want to multiply 9 times 8, for example, you count 8 fingers, so it would be between this finger here, drop it down, 9 times 8 is 72. Got it? 9 times 6. 9 times 6 is 54. All right? And also, all of these things, they all switch. 9 times 2 is 18. 9 times 9 is 81. 18 and 81 are swapped. 27 and 72 a swap, 36 and 63 a swap. All sorts of patterns when you do arithmetic with the number nine. Nine has some magic properties, okay? Uh, do, Alan, do you think you were able to get the, get it up? Best I can do. Huh? Best I can do. No, I made it louder. Okay. okay. Now, talking about magic numbers, any of you remember the series called School of Rock? Yeah. yeah! All right. I'm getting good results today. What is the magic number in School of Rock? You remember that? Three. I heard it say it loud. Three. Three. Okay, well, four, four's got some interesting properties, too, but three is what School of Rock called it's, it's a magic number. Well, a few years ago, there was a movie that was very popular, and it wasn't called Schoolhouse Rock. It was called School of Rock. And uh, Jack Black played a substitute teacher, and he was teaching some mathematics, but the principal heard some music coming from the room. So she comes in and challenges him, and this is his result when she challenges his methods of teaching. It's a really cool thing. So get off your ass and do some math, 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 math. Three minus four is negative one. That's right. And six times a billion is six billion. Nailed it. And 54 is a 25 more than what is the capture of water? Nine. No, it's eight. <laughs> no, it's nine. <laughs> yes, I was testing you. It's nine. <laughs> and that's a magic number. I would imagine some of you had seen that movie. You know, that's very popular movies on TV a lot. Um, three is an example of what we call a prime number. Now, a prime number 
is a number greater than one that has only two factors, that is one and itself. So three is prime, actually two is prime, it's the only even prime number. When you get to four, that's not a prime number, okay? Uh, now nine is not a prime number, but it can factor into three times three. And every number that's not prime is called composite. And if you factor a composite number into its primes, it only factors one way. For example, 28. You could factor 28 as 4 times 7, and then 4 factors as 2 times 2. So 28 is 2 times 2 times 7. And that's called the prime factorization. All right? So with that little background, let's look at this next scene, which comes from a movie called Contact. It stars Jodie Foster. And she plays an astronomer who is looking for intelligent life in outer space. And this is her first encounter with, um, with something out there. That was kind of a comical scene there. But um, prime numbers are the building blocks. Oops, sorry. Are the building blocks of our number system. And uh, there are infinitely many prime numbers. And that's known. That was proved 2,000 years ago. But there are some problems in mathematics that have taken a long time to solve and some that have never been solved. And one of them is called Fermat's Last Theorem. And that was stated over 400 years ago, but was not proved until about 15 years ago by a mathematician at Princeton University named Andrew Wiles, and he will be famous for the rest of eternity because he proved Fermat's last theorem. Now, another famous conjecture, which is thought to be true but has never been proved, is Goldbach's conjecture. And you're going to see a statement of this in this next scene, which comes from a movie called Fermat's Room. ¿Sabéis lo que son los números primos? Porque si no sabéis lo que son los números primos, mejor que os vayáis de aquí. En 1742, el matemático Christian Goldbach se fijó en que los números pares se podían expresar como la suma de dos números pequeños. Es fácil ver los números pequeños. El 18 par es 7 más 11, que son primos. El 24 es 5 más 19, que son primos. El 50 es 13 más 37, y así con todos. Y mi número par. 
Cien. Eh, eh, mil. Cien es ochenta y tres más diecisiete. Y mil quinientos veintiuno más cuatrocientos setenta y nueve. Y los números mucho más grandes también. Siete mil ciento veinte. Siete mil ciento doce es... 5.119 más 1.993. Primo los dos. La cuestión es que no se puede ir comprobando si todos los números pares son la suma de los números primos, porque si los números son infinitos, habría que encontrar una ley que nos abarcase a todos. Y encontrarla se ha convertido en el problema más difícil de la historia de las matemáticas. ¿Para qué más? Para que tengamos un Sí, claro. ¿Quién más? ¿Quién es? Para Inés. Gracias. Y suerte, ¿eh? Gracias. ¿Por qué lo suerte? No, nah, el 20 de febrero presentó mi demostración en la conjetura de Gota. ¡Sube! ¡Rápido! conjecture. It says every even number greater than two can be expressed as the sum of two prime numbers. For example, eight is three plus five, or, or ten is five plus five. It doesn't, they don't have to be different. And you can go up and up and up, and you'll always find, as long as man has tried to do this, try to, you can always find two prime numbers that will add up to give you that even number. But in mathematics, that's not enough. You have to be able to prove this holds for all even numbers, and that's what he was talking about in that scene. This is one of the great unsolved problems of mathematics. Now, that comes in the, the study of number theory. And in number theory, there is, um, there is another term called a perfect number. Now, let me tell you what a perfect number is. We're gonna 28 is an example of a perfect number, and let me show you why. I'm going to call out the factors of 28, and I want you to add them in your head as I go along, okay? Up to 28. We're not going to include 28 in uh, itself. So the first factor is 1. So I add these as I go along. 2, 4, 7, and 14. Now, if you added those up correctly, what did you get to? 28, what, what we started with, right? Well, that doesn't happen very often. 28 is the example of a perfect number. There are only 50 known perfect numbers. All of them, all of them are even. There are no odd known perfect numbers. Lots of unanswered questions about perfect numbers. All right, with that little background, I want to look at a short scene from an old Clint Eastwood movie. Now, Clint is a very famous director now in Hollywood, but if you did, it, and some of you are fairly young, and so you may not know that he started as an actor, and he, he starred in a lot of old westerns, and this one is called The Good, the Bad, and the Ugly. Okay, and this is the Six more bullets in my gun. 
<laughs> so now, is six a perfect number according to mathematicians? Let's think of the factors of six. One, two, and three. You add them up, yes, it's the smallest perfect number. Now, if I ever get to meet Clint Eastwood, I'm going to ask him if he really knew the mathematical significance of that scene in The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly. I kind of doubt it, but um, you never know. Um, we were talking a little earlier about pi. Pi is one of the most famous irrational numbers, and an irrational number is a number that has a decimal that never terminates and never repeats. It just goes on infinitely, forever and ever, without any pattern or any repetition. Okay. Now, um, in the original Star Trek series, an alien entity had taken over the computer banks of the Starship Enterprise, and uh, Kirk and Spock were trying to figure out a way to get that alien out of there, and Spock came up with a way. Class A compulsory directive. Compute to the last digit the value of pi. As we know, the value of pi is a transcendental figure without resolution. The computer banks will work on this problem to the exclusion of all else until we order it to stop. And I should keep that thing busy for a while. Mathematics saved the day. Computer couldn't couldn't um, finish the task. Decided to leave, and the start and the Enterprise was uh, was able to fly away. I got to tell you a little personal note. I was preparing this disc a few weeks ago to, to give this presentation, and on the day I was preparing it, I heard the news that Leonard Nimoy had passed away, and that was that was just a tough one because he was a, a big part of uh, science fiction and logic, and uh, a lot of us of my era looked up to him. Uh, from when he when he had this role, um, a little bit more about Pi. Uh, this is going to show up in this next scene, which comes from a series called Northern Exposure, which aired back in the 1990s, and it dealt with a a, a, a small town in Alaska and the and the, the people that lived in it. And the scene that you're going to see here, um, the the actor John Corbett. It, uh, plays a, a character who has just had an accident in his truck in front of a stranger's home, and he has to go talk to the person at the house about this accident. Yeah, I just have this feeling if I could take pie, well, past all the static, take pie. 
occupying 10 million, 20 million teachers, that I find something really incredible. Not just a pattern, not just an order, but a, a sign, a mathematical sign. Yes. So, can you tell me something? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Killed your dog. <laughs> <laughs> Eyes pulls on forever and ever, and they're gazing through each other's eyes. And killed your dog. Um, but anyway, she was researching Pi, and actually, research continues to this day. And uh, we know, with computer help, we know 10 trillion digits of Pi. But that is wow. barely broken the surface because it goes on forever and ever. Now, pi appears in a, quite a few geometric formulas, one being the formula for the area of a circle, and the area of pi times the radius squared. That's how you find the area of a circle. And I'll bet you a bunch of you know what the next movie is. I think I heard it. Castaway, and who are we looking at here? Wilson. Wilson, the most famous ball in all of, in all of movies. Well, Tom Hanks plays a Federal Express employee who has been in a plane crash, and he's the only survivor on an island, and uh, Wilson becomes his friend, and he has dialogue with Wilson. And in this one, he's trying to figure out how big a, a land, how big an area rescuers would have to search in order to find them. So, oh. we were Henry, not just for 11 and a half hours, uh, 475 miles an hour, so they think that we are right here. But we went out, the radio contact, and flew around that storm for about an hour. So that's a distance of about 400 miles. 400 miles squared, that's 160,000 times pi, 1.14, That's a search area of 500,000 square miles. It's twice the size of Texas. And they never find us. Well, being the math nerd that I am, when I watched that movie in the theater originally, I had to go home immediately and find out if that was correct. It turns out uh, that is that was about twice the size of Texas. So um, you saw that the use of he multiplied 400, which was the distance he had traveled. Um, uh, squared that and then multiplied by pi. That's the radius squared times pi to get the area of a circle. Good mathematics in that movie. Okay? But not all movies have good mathematics. And one of the most famous um, of all math movie appearances is in The Wizard of Oz, right after the scarecrow gets his brain. <laughs> My virtue of the authority vested in me by the Universal Partners Committee Artem E. Pluribus Unum, I hereby confer upon you the honorary degree of Ph.D. <laughs> Ph.D.? <laughs> Doctor of Theology. No, I the square root of any two sides of an isosceles triangle is equal to the square root of the remaining side. Oh, John, <laughs> I've got a brain. How can I ever thank you enough? Well, you can't. You. No, he can't. Okay. <laughs> now I'm going to repeat what he said, and I want to see if some, somebody can tell me what's uh, what's not quite right about it. He says the sum of the square roots of any two sides of an isosceles triangle is equal to the square root of the remaining side. Ah, uh, love see hands go up. Yes, sir. Uh, no, not quite, but you're on the right track. Yeah. It's a right, it's got to be a right triangle. The Pythagorean theorem applies to a right triangle. And there's one other inaccuracy in there 
and he talks about square roots, but it's actually squares because the Pythagorean theorem says a squared plus b squared equals c squared. It doesn't have square roots in it. Okay. Well, it sounds really good, but it's dead wrong. Okay. <laughs> Fifty years later, um, the writers of a very popular television show paid tribute to this scene, and here it is. You know where that is. I mean, there's something you don't see in a toilet every day. Anybody lose their glasses? Last chance. Woohoo! <laughs> so the square roots of any two sides of an isosceles triangle is equal to the square root of the remaining side. That's a right triangle, you idiot! <laughs> <laughs> If you, want to, if you want to see a listing of, of a lot of the mathematics that has appeared in The Simpsons for like 25 years that has been there, go to SimpsonsMath.com and you can find this and a lot of other appearances of mathematics. Okay? Now, how many teachers do we have in here? Raise your hand high. Okay? All right. Um, do you people appreciate how much these teachers do for you? Okay. Well, that's good. That's good. All right? So now, this next, you'll see why I asked this question in this, this next scene. This comes from, and you'll immediately see the name of it. Blue Collar TV. teaching them the, the uh, quadratic formula. And you notice how he says all over 2A? Uh, that's there's, there's interesting because a common student mistake is when applying that formula not to put the fraction bar under the minus B. And so as teachers, we, we, we usually try to emphasize to put it all over 2A, and he nailed it right on the head there. Okay. Um, this, as I mentioned a, a couple of minutes ago, the Simpsons has had mathematics in it for many years. One, one episode of some years back, uh, it, it dealt with uh, gender issues in education. And at the time, there was discussion about the role of women and men in, in, in education. And this, uh, this uh, episode was titled, Girls Just Want to Have Sums. And what had happened is the Springfield High School had been divided up into a boys' school and a girls' school. Okay, and Bart, who is not your best student in the world, uh, was put in the in the boys' school, and Lisa, who is an excellent student, was put in the girls' school. And this is Lisa's reaction to her math class in uh, in this particular episode. Now that the boys and their atmosphere of intimidation are gone, we can finally breathe. Breathe, ladies. <sighs> now let's buckle down and do some math. Yes! How do numbers make you feel? What does a plus sign smell like? Is the number seven odd or just different? Are we going to do any actual math problems? Problems? That's how men see math, something to be attacked, to be figured out. But isn't it? I mean, confidence building can't replace real learning. Uh-oh, Lisa. Sounds like you're trying to derail our self-esteem engine. Let's sing it back on the tracks. The best thing I can ever be is to be okay with me. Me! <laughs> Okay, 
boy school. I need a challenge. A mental challenge. <laughs> Tell me the volume of this snowman. Anyone? Just add the volume of the spheres. We know the radii. He forgot the volume of the carrot nose. One third base times height. Oh man, I have missed you. No girls allowed. Principal Skinner. It's groundskeeper Skinner now. Assistant groundskeeper, you puke. Assistant groundskeeper Skinner, don't you think it's wrong that I can't get the best math education because I'm a girl? <sighs> I don't have any opinions anymore. All I know is that no one is better than anyone else and everyone is the best at everything. Not you! You're the worst! Now get poisoning those squirrels! <laughs> <laughs> Please, be reasonable. I'm not sure what Mom, the girls' school is a joke and I'm not allowed to take the boys' math. When I was in school, I loved math. Until... Hey, Professor Brian Hubba Hubba. Wanna hop in my June bug and then road some beach? Oh, I'd love to, but I've got my calculus final tomorrow. Come on, baby. The only math you need is you plus me equals forever. Oh, homie. Since then, I haven't been able to do any of the calculus I've encountered in my daily life. But that's not going to happen to you. Well, what calculus do you encounter in your daily life if you're not taking the calculus school? Um, the way this ends is that Lisa disguises herself as a boy, enrolls in the boys' school, and wins the math award. So uh, you can find that online or on DVD or I don't know if it's on Netflix, but not hard to find. It's a, it's a really good episode. Uh, this dealt with women in mathematics, and, and if you're a lady and you're good in mathematics and strong, uh, go for it. Don't, don't let that, um, that gender bias that's been around for a long time uh, affect you. Just go for it. Right? And this next scene, it sort of emphasizes that. Now, I've got to tell you, the volume is very low on this, so you're going to have to pay close attention, but it comes from a movie called Smilla's Sense of Snow. And Smilla is uh, played by Julia Orman, who is absolutely beautiful in this movie. And she's a mathematician who lives in Greenland and studies ice and snow. And this is a scene at, at a dinner table uh, with, with a friend of hers. My father thinks about me from Greenland. Greenland. And 
that's that's what I can't live without. That's why I can't be locked up. <laughs> Was that a sensuous description of the mathematics yeah. of the real numbers or what, man? Yes. You know, do you think he gets the kiss? Yeah. Yes. You have to watch the movie to find out. It's Smilla, S M I L L A. Smilla's sense of snow. And actually, there's not a whole lot of mathematics in the movie. It's, it's more of a, of a, a detective murder mystery type thing. It's a foreign film, and it's very good. Um, I suggest you watch it. A few, a few years ago, uh, there was a run for about six or seven years of the series on CBS called Numbers. And Numbers uh, dealt with a mathematician and, an FBI, and his brother, who was an FBI agent, in solving crimes. And, and the mathematician helped his, uh, helped his brother solve the crimes by using math. It was uh, the, um, the math guy, was, his, his uh, name was Charlie Epps in the, in the series. And in one of the, one of the episodes, near the end, after the, the, the murder has been solved, uh, they're having a little party at their dad's house. And, and Charlie gets a chance to, uh, to say something about mathematics to one of his colleagues who has some misgivings uh, about the subject. I think you might find out. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Math is the real world, okay? It's everywhere, okay? Hey, can I show you? Please. Um, you see how the, the petals spiral? The number of petals in each row is the sum of the preceding two rows, the Fibonacci sequence. It's, it's found in the structure of crystals and the spiral of galaxies in a number of the ship. What's more, the ratio between each number in the sequence to the one before it is approximately 1.61803. What the Greeks called the golden ratio. It shows up pyramids in Giza and the Parthenon in Athens and this card. It's based on the number you can find. is nature's language, its method of communicating directly with us. Everything is numbers. Okay, well, when you explain it to her, this is a lot more interesting. The Fibonacci sequence and the golden ratio are mentioned in that scene, and those are two fascinating topics that are very closely related. And uh, they, uh, they appeared in the, the Da Vinci Code, the movie and the book. If you've seen that, you might, have, you might recognize it, or you might recognize it from other places as well. The golden ratio that he mentioned, 1.618, etc., well, uh, that is an irrational number, just like pi is. It goes on and on and on and on forever with, with no resolution. Uh, some other irrational numbers that we can come, we come across in our in our elementary work are m certain square roots. Now, if I ask you to find, say, the square root of 49, well, that's pretty easy because 49 is a perfect square, and the square root of 49 is seven. Uh, the square root of 36, that's easy as well. But if I ask you to to give me uh, the square root of three. Uh, you might say, well, you want a decimal? And I say, yeah, give me a decimal for it, okay? Now, if anybody's got a calculator, I would sure appreciate you pull it out and tell the, um, tell the group what you see on your calculator. I see this gentleman do it, and I really appreciate it. And just call out the digits as, as loud. 1.732. 050808. Okay, 1.7 something, right? Right. Okay. But that is an irrational Second number, and, and what you have there is only the first the first few decimal places of it, it goes on forever. Alright. That sets the stage for this next scene, which comes from a movie that has very few redeeming qualities except the one I'm going to show you. And it's called Harold and Kumar Escape from Guantanamo Bay. Alright, and this 
This scene, uh, Kumar is attending the wedding of his ex-girlfriend and he causes a scene and she, uh, she approaches him and uh, this is how he responds. Such is my reality, a sad irrationality. My heart, so what is this I see? Another square root of a three has quietly come waltzing by. Together now we multiply, form a number we prefer, rejoicing as an integer. We break free from our mortal bonds, and with a wave of magic wands, our square root signs become unglued, and love for me has been renewed. about you, but I just think that is a really cool poem, all right? When he says the square root of three multiplied with the square root of three and together we become an integer. I mean, really, guys and girls, has your, has your lover ever told you that? All right. But I just, I think that's a wonderful poem and actually it's very easy to find the words to it. If you Google um, square root of three poem, it was written by a man named David Feinberg and was used in this uh, otherwise um, pretty awful movie. <laughs> All right. Now, if you've taken geometry or trigonometry, you may have learned uh, in studying right triangles that if a right triangle has a 30 degree angle, the side opposite is one half. The, the length of the, the hypotenuse. The, no matter what the, si uh, the size of the triangle is, the ratio of opposite to hypotenuse is 1 over 2, or, or 0.5. Okay? And uh, that's called the sine ratio. Now, there are some angles that have nice signs, like the sine of 30 degrees, but most of them don't have such nice sine values, and to get them, you've got to go to a calculator. The 30 degrees is one of those examples where you can get the exact value, namely one half. All right? Now, keep that in mind, and we're going to move to my favorite current television show and see if you can catch the, um, the, the, the uh, reference to what I just told you in this scene. <laughs> The nearly 14 million years ago, expansion started way before. Began to cool the autotrophs, began to draw me in. All the developed tools we built a wall. We built a paradise, math, science, history, unraveling the mystery that all started with a big bang. Hey! Okay. Our apartment's on the fourth floor, but the elevator's broken, so you're gonna have to. Are you just gonna be done? Okay, cool. Thanks. <laughs> Because we'll just bring it up ourselves. I hardly think so. <laughs> Why not? Well, we don't have a dolly or lifting belts or any measurable upper body strength. <laughs> we don't need strength. We're physicists. We are the intellectual descendants of Archimedes. Give me a full kind of lever and I can move the earth. It's just a matter of. I don't have to. I don't have to. <laughs> Archimedes would be so proud. <laughs> Do you have any ideas? Uh, yes, but they all involve a green lantern and a power ring. Easy. Easy. Okay. Uh, now we've got an inclined plane. 
force required to lift is reduced by the sign of the angle of the stairs, call it 30 degrees, so about half. Exactly half. <laughs> Take the hit. <laughs> Push. Okay. See, it's moving. This is easy. All the math. What's your formula for the corner? What? <laughs> Uh, okay, yeah, no problem. Just come up here and help me pull a chair. Ah, gravity, thou art a heartless bitch. <laughs> All right, did you catch a, about a half? And, and Sheldon says, exactly. Uh, Leonard says, exactly a half. Well, that's what he was talking about, the sign in. Now, I got to tell you something. I got in yesterday crashed in my hotel room, turned on TBS to watch four episodes of this, and what was one of the episodes that, that was airing? This one. Did anybody happen to see that last night? You did that? <laughs> I'm telling you, I, I just, I love this series. I can watch it over, I can binge it, you know, over, over and over. I love it. All right. <clears throat> Let me see what my next one is here. Um, okay. Uh, now, this, this next scene is just for fun. And uh, let, me, let me just uh, bring up the fact that many words in our language come from mathematics. A dozen, for example. That's 12. You know what a baker's dozen is? 13. One extra. All right? Now, this scene comes from a 1940s movie that starred Abbott and Costello, who was called In the Navy. And there's, there's a little bit of arithmetic involved in this one. It involves the number 13. So here are Abbott and Costello.
you ever, did a teacher ever tell you, well, if you want to check yourself, try to work a problem a couple ways and see if you get the same answer to it? Well, they did it three ways. They got the same result and they were all wrong. But uh, their, their most famous comedy routine is who's on first. And all you got to do is go to YouTube and find that. And that's classic. It deals with baseball names. Okay? Um, now, like dozen and baker's dozen are mathematically related. Numbers that start with the prefix DEC uh, are mathematics related because DEC or DES means 10. We have a decimal number system. Uh, the decathlon is uh, 10 events, and you all, I'm sure, know what a decade is, right? In, in 10 years, all right? So uh, keep that in mind now. And many of you are in your, in your 20s or maybe your 30s, all right? Think, think about the age of your parents, and if you're older than that, think about how old you were when you, I mean, how old your parents were when you were in your 20s. Okay, now, just give you a second to think about your parents' ages. And now, let's watch Dumb and Dumber, Gloria and Joe in the newlywed game. How many decades will your husband say his mother has lived? Gloria. Ten decades. Ten decades. <laughs> How many decades has your mother lived? Oh, you have a troubled look on your face. What's the matter? Oh, I don't know what a decade is. <laughs> four years, four, four, so she'd be good. It's four years a decade. She'd be ten decades. <laughs> This last one is audience participation, and you can all get a chance to, uh, to participate in this one. And it comes from a David Copperfield television special from back in the 1980s. Now I take this off my VHS recorder when I had only an antenna and no cable television, so the, uh, the quality is not the best, but you can see what's going on. Now, in this episode, uh, well in this uh, special, David Copperfield was working up to, at the end, making a train car disappear. And about halfway through the show, he asked the audience at home to come up to the television, television and help him decide which train car he would make disappear at the end of the show. So in order for this to work, you're going to have to be pointing up at the screen following his directions. If you don't, it's not going to make any sense. So here we go. Here's the idea. Tonight, you and Bert are going to put your finger on a car and move around the train. And I'm going to find you. The amazing thing is, even though you're at home and I'm here, I'll know exactly where you are. And the car that I find you in will be the train car that I attempt to vanish tonight. Here are the rules. In a moment, I'm going to ask you to choose a car to start on. Then I'll ask you to move, say, four times. For example, if you were to choose a male, you could count up or down, side to side, frontwards, or backwards on any adjoining car like this. One, two, three, four. Or one, two, three, four. There are infinite possibilities, but never move diagonally. This is your last chance to participate, so come real close to your TV to be able to touch the screen. Right now, go ahead and select one of the cars to start by placing your finger on the screen. It's your choice. Touch a car now. <laughs> Good. Keep your finger on the screen. I'm going to make it even harder for me to find you by adding more cars. Get ready to move to four other cars. Remember, never move diagonally. Never skip over cars. Just up or down or side to side to four other cars. Move as I count. Ready? One, two, three, four. When you finish, leave your finger on the last car you've touched. Now I know that you're not in the staff car, so I'll take it away. When a car has been removed, you may not move on to that space, but you still have eight other cars in which to move. With your finger on the last car you touched, stand by to move your finger up or down or side to side to five other cars. It's your choice. Move as I count. Ready? One, two, three, four, five. Okay, I can tell you're not in the club car, so I'll remove it. 
Now move two more times. Ready? One, two. Good. I can see you're not in the mail car, so I'll get rid of the mail car. Move three times now. Ready? One, two, three. Okay. I know you're not in the baggage car. Or the coast. There are only four cars left. Now move three more times. Ready? One, two, three. A few seconds ago, many of you were in the shower, but you're not there now, so I'll take it away. Remember, you have a free choice every step of the way. Stand by to move once. Ready? Move. And keep your finger there. Remember, you started where you wanted and you moved where you wanted. But believe it or not, even though you're at home and I'm here, I know exactly where you are. You, the murderer, are not the engine. You're not in the bar. <laughs> It's all due to mathematics. It's all due to mathematics. I watched it a few times and I figured out how it's done. And if I got it, I'll, I'll give you a, a quick hint. If he knows whether you have moved an even or an odd number of times total, and he's got two groups of cars in there, the original ones and the ones he put in. And based on how many times you have moved, he knows you're in one or the other of those groups. And so as he, as he has you move around, he just takes cars out of the other group and forces you into the diner. And that's how that works. And I have one quick snippet to show you what happened in, in, uh, in one of the other scenes uh, after, after the original scene. Thank you very much. Um, and I just, I like to tell you, I'd like to end my talks with something from the National Council of Teachers of Mathematics. They say, do math and you can do anything. If you're good in math and, and you pursue it, you will never have to find, have to go looking for a job. People will come looking for you. Every, how about a nice round of applause for John Hornby? All right, don't go anywhere, guys. Don't go anywhere.